I've worked for Practical Action now for 15 years. I know our work intimately, but what I'm going to talk about today is three different things. I'm going to talk about uh, Fritz Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, and why so many of his ideas are hugely relevant. I'm going to talk about Practical Action, the organisation Fritz Schumacher set up 50 years ago as ITDG. Anybody remember us as ITDG? Yeah. Intermediate Technology Development Group. And our 50 year history of working together with people in the developing world to help end poverty and build a sustainable future. And finally, the scary bit for me, because this is quite new to us, I'm going to talk about technology justice and why in the 21st century we need a vision of technology that is equally, if not as radical, as Fritz's vision from Small is Beautiful was in the 20th. A vision that echoes many of Fritz's ideas and builds on them from practical actions 50 years of experience, and that recognises and acknowledges the transformative role that technology plays in our society, its increasing power, and the fact that actually, from a societal perspective, very few people are talking about it. So practical action is stepping up to the mark, and we're going to have a go at talking about technology and society. Poverty as described in Small is Beautiful is still recognisable. You all recognise it. And I feel a bit sort of like I'm, I don't know, teaching my granny to suck eggs if my granny was still alive. Um, Fritz talked about a world where the poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer, where development cooperation primarily benefits the rich, and where poor people struggle to find jobs, flock to cities, and where science and technology has helped construct a system of production that ravishes nature and a type of society that mutilates man. I think this sounds familiar to all of us, and we've heard a lot about this already today. Uh, my brief is to up be upbeat and to talk about the future, but I also want to go back over some of the statistics and to remind ourselves of them. I think that we all recognise the Oxfam bus and the fact that the world's richest 80 people are as wealthy as the poorest half of them. Now, a couple of months ago, I was reading an article by Forbes, the business magazine, which actually said, this is a load of rubbish. Now, we're not going to go there, because I think we all know that inequality matters. But what they actually said was that Oxfam had got their stats wrong and the world had changed, and now it was 60-something people who owned <laughs> the same wealth as the poorest half of the world. I wasn't sure why that was a counter-argument, but maybe that's how they saw it. The other thing that I wanted to bring your attention to is, OK, so you've got the Walmart family in America, only more than the bottom 40% of Americans. You've got the richest 1% of the UK, only the same as the 50 poorest 50% put together. But it's a phenomena, this inequality, that actually exists in Africa as well. And the 10 richest Africans own as much as the poorest half of the continent. And that's not a sort of fluffy figure from anywhere that, you know, you might not trust. That's a figure from the World Bank. But inequality is not only about wealth. And I want to admit to what I see as being Fritz's blind spot. The inequality is about gender. And this is again a stat from America. But can I ask, <laughs> can I ask who in this building is uh, named John, Robert, James, or William? <laughs> a few of you. Uh, they don't want to raise their hands. But in the States, men named John, Robert, James and William outnumber all of the women on corporate boards. In the UK, we've got something that some people saw as being a success, where we now have 29% of MPs being women. They see it's a success by it because it's up by 4 or 5%. Really sorry, but that ain't a success for me. In the developing world, well, there aren't any stats. Nobody knows how many poor people are women, but the majority are. The figure that says 70% of the world's poor are female, women or girls, was actually an estimate 
some 20 or so years ago. And actually, nobody's ever done the research to find out what it really is, which speaks volumes of the importance of gender in development to me. And yet women bear the brunt of poverty. Women bear the brunt of caring for their families. Women are the ones that will collect most of the firewood and the water. Women who, when they're collecting firewood and water, face the threat of rape. Women who have to look after the elderly. Women who, when the, the tsunami struck Sri Lanka, were dead much, much more than the, their male counterparts because the women stay behind on the whole more readily to look after elderly relatives or their children. I recently visited Zimbabwe and the Bulalima district where I met a group of women who were um, actually living in a situation where they're facing drought and there's likely to be extreme hunger. And Practical Action is working with those women to help them diversify their food production and to also earn an income. And having talked to them, I said to the women, said to the women, what does it feel like to be a woman here. Most of the men are overworking in Southern Africa, in South Africa or in Botswana. What does it feel like to be a woman here? And they sort of looked at me as if this was a really, really strange question. And then 30 seconds later, one of the women sort of looks at her, ca her counterparts and they started dancing and singing. And then this woman grabbed a jumper and she stuck it up the front of her jumper. And then she grabbed a handbag and she attached it to the back of her herself. So as if it was another baby. And then she grabbed a toddler and put him on her shoulders. And she was dancing along as if she was carrying water or carrying firewood. And the women were singing about the burden of being a woman. Because that for them was the only way that they could express it was through the power of song. Another thing that Fritz talked about was that development cooperation primarily benefits the rich. Well, I'm not so certain about that. A lot of development cooperation has helped people escape from poverty. But then you think of Tide Aid in America. You think of the increasing corporatization of development. And you think of the fact that now we no longer adopt a rights-based approach to development, but we're talking much more about eco economies and economic development, the corporatization of development, so that even for our own government, one of their biggest suppliers now would not be Oxfam or Christian Aid or Save the Children, it would be PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers. That's how it works these days. And in terms of jobs, between now and 2030, more than a billion young people will enter the labor market. Every month, more than a million people seek jobs in Africa, and another million in India. 80% of those people fail. It's a huge societal problem in terms of young people getting access to jobs. And yet again, we're not considering it from an equity point of view. And one of the things that I'm really proud of with NEF is they're calling for a 21 hour week. So when in the UK, we're working far, far, far too long, our hours are extortionate, we work some of the longest hours in Europe, a 21-hour week. Let's get equitable about our jobs. And of course, over 50% of the world's population now needs in, lives in cities, and by 2050, it's estimated that that will be 70%. Then there's climate change, soil degradation, and researchers say that the nine processes needed to sustain life on Earth Four of them have now exceeded safe levels. Human climate change, the loss of bios biosphere integrity, land system change, and the high levels of phosphorus and nitrogen flowing into our seas. We have a really big problem, and the world needs to change. I think this is one of the great quotes that Schumacher made and I do call him Fritz quite often, because actually, I never met him, but I do sort of think of him as a friend. Um, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. Which kind of brings me to practical action. So,
So about development from small is beautiful. What was said was what the poor need most are simple things, building materials, clothes, household goods, agricultural implements, and a better return for their agricultural products. They urgently need in many places trees, water, crop storage facilities. Agricultural population could be helped immensely if they could feed themselves and, shape and, and have the first uh, stages of processing their products. These are ideal fields for intermediate technology. So what do we do? Well, this is one of the early pictures of intermediate technology, ITDG's work. This is in um, Nigeria in 1972. And what it is, is a bicycle-powered, treadle pump-powered cassava grinder. Sort of very simple things that practical action has been known for. This was just a couple of years ago in Bangladesh. And this is a, a guy who's been helped set up his own business repairing bicycles. Very simple, very straightforward. But then you get to situations where you're starting with communities and you're thinking, well, what do they need? And what they need is actually probably a bit more complex, but you can still find simple solutions. So this is Bangladesh. And what this community needed, they were living on the banks of this river, you can see their houses there, was more land. And the answer was to build rafts that become floating gardens on which they can plant crops. Simple, effective, yet not actually very radical. Because the reality is, practical action borrowed this idea. So it actually came from the Incas. It had been in Bangladesh, not in this quite this form till 1939, and we reintroduced it. So borrowing technology and making it work again. This is a gravity ropeway in Nepal. The people used to walk for about five hours down the mountainside, carrying these huge loads of crops. And when they got to the bottom, what would happen? Well, somebody might buy it, they might not, but they could bargain down the price because there was no way what they could do was take it back up the mountain for another five, five hours and come back again the next day. But now, with mobile phones, what they do is that they station somebody from the village at the bottom of the gravity ropeway, and then they wait until the price is the price that's acceptable to them, or the best price. Then they ship it down in about 10 minutes. It's really transformed that community. Solar lighting, sorry, not solar lighting, solar pumping of clean water in Kenya. Again, simple solutions to quite complex problems. And finally, you saw the floating gardens and the problems in Bangladesh with lack of water, sorry, lack of land. Well, the land actually exists, but for most of the year, it's flooded. So when the floods have gone, and this, this silt is available to you, what can you do with it? Well, it was actually being left barren. But one of the things that Practical Action's been able to do is to actually get involved in pit cultivation. So what they do is they <coughs> dig little pits, they put compost in those pits, and then they grow pumpkins. And there's something like 5,000 people now growing pumpkins in this area. Simple solutions that have multiplied and magnified. So in the last year, Practical Action has helped 1.2 million people directly. But we don't regard ourselves. We talked about Fritz Schumacher in education earlier. We don't regard ourselves as a direct implementer, and that's all we do. We regard ourselves as an organization that learns and then shares. This is incredibly important to us, that actually people can learn from what we do, and people can actually share our own experience and we help others share, share their knowledge. And these are just some examples of how we've shared internationally in the last year, including down here what's called the Krishi Call Centre, which again is in Bangladesh, which is answering toll-free calls from farmers across Bangladesh about everything from fisheries to cattle to livestock and to actually crop problems that they may have in sharing the knowledge and spreading the impact. And then this is one that I love. This is podcasting. This is in Zimbabwe. And in truth, you probably could do with it a tape recorder. 
but everybody loves a bit of kit. Sad to say it, but everybody loves a bit of kit. And this is podcasting that we introduced about five years ago, where it has agricultural messages that are then broadcast to communities. What's been great about this is that the communities love it and have ta it's taken on a life of its own. So now, as well as the agricultural messages that you get, people are also using it to, to broadcast messages from the police or from for education messages or other things. So I mentioned that I was in Zimbabwe about four weeks ago talking to these podcasters, and one of the things we said to them was, well, what's the most important thing, what's the most important lesson that's been learnt by this community through podcasting? I don't think anybody would guess, or I might ask you to. It was a reduction in child sex abuse, because they now knew what to look out for, and they were now taking care of children. Not a practical action message, but using this technology that we'd introduced to build other messages. So, I'm going to talk about technology justice. And um, technology justice is where it gets scary for me, because this is very new for us. And I can talk about the problems, but it's going to be interesting to talk about solutions. It's also scary because it's a huge challenge in the world. Technology is something that we actually sometimes feel that we can't control, that we can't own that is a runaway, don't know, a runaway horse, a runaway car, a runaway train, out of control. But just looking at some of the problems, let's guess. I think it's probably pretty uh, obvious, but do you think there is a greater amount spent each year onto a re into a research for a cure for male baldness or a research into finding a vaccine for malaria? Mel Baldness, hands up. Easy question, which can more money be made on? Which can more money be made on? Well, somebody reckons that there's 10 times more money to be made on Mel Baldness. Possibly more. In terms of the health research and the spending on it, well, the percentage of global deaths that are preventable each year, 93% are in lower middle income countries, but most of where the research is going is into the problems of high-income countries, male, male baldness, obesity, diabetes, 97% of the money's going there. This is about subsidies. And again, we subsidise as a world what we believe in. And what these slides show is just two examples of what we are subsidising as a world. So the subsidies into industries that cause deforestation are 100 times more than the aid to prevent it. Possibly not a shock, but still scary. And then this one is actually from uh, the International Monetary Fund and Bloomberg, which, you know, again, not renowned as left-leading left organisations, but the fossil fuel subsidies at 6.5% of GDP. Imagine how high that is. That's got the externalities built into it, you know, what is the impact of it as well. But even without that, it's incredibly high. And then we have, again, from the World Economic Forum, so if you're thinking about developing technology, what are those technologies going to be look, look like? What are the things that are going to make most difference? Where are you going to put your efforts? Well, I think there's um, smart robots, that might be good. Or if you come down here, gamification. Uh, oh, dear me. Cryptocurrencies? No idea what they are myself. 3D scanners, gesture control, virtual reality. Basically, our world is following a consumer path, and the way that people see technology going is led by that consumerism. We don't think that's right. I put this in because it amused me slightly. <laughs> BBC News thought it was important enough to pick it up, pick up on it. And then this next one, I think, speaks to absolute arrogance of technology organisations and the way that we view technology. IBM supercomputer Watson uses TED Talks and can answer your deepest questions. Now, 
Somebody asked me how old I was, and I, I am 53. So I grew up with some of this technology with Star Trek, and I also grew up with Hitchhiker's Hide to the Guide to the Galaxy. So I'm desperate, yes, I'm desperate to put what's the meaning of life into it and get the answer 42. But I probably won't. So where are we going? What's happening with this? Well, we're developing a concept of technology justice. And to borrow from a great phrase that Neff have used, we're talking about a great transition. A transition from technology as we know now to technology where it's actually people-centered. Technologies where the focus of the brightest minds around technology are not on consumerism, not on how can we get uh, gamification or robots that paint nails, but where the brightest minds of a generation are actually looking at the main issues that we face as a planet, helping end poverty, and protect our planet. In technology justice, we're looking to call for a start of technology with people, people-centered technology. We're looking at technology that is life-enhancing and that works within our planetary boundaries. We're looking at, at access and control, not market domination by the few, but technology for everybody who needs it. And we're also starting to think about societal shaping of technology and what Fritz Schumacher looked at where he looked at the um, violent technologies as, composed, as opposed to the organic and the meek and the gentle technologies. So I said this was a bit scary because it's actually a concept that we're developing and that's new for us. We're doing it because we don't see enough people speaking out about technologies and we're just starting. So we have developed a, um, a briefing paper that was launched in the last week. We're looking at developing a book that will be launched in September, October time. We're also developing a manifesto that I hope will set out the principles of technology justice, again launched in September. And we've already agreed in January 2016 that we'll host together with the University of Edinburgh a conference on technology justice. So our concepts will be together by then. But practical action will always continue to go quietly about our work in the developing world. We'll continue to use simple, practical and sustainable technologies to help people transform their lives. But we will also now face the big injustice and fight for technology justice. Fritz Schumacher said to talk about the future is only useful if it happens now. That's kind of my, my final message. But I, I want to talk about age. I've already said I'm 53. I want to talk about age. So I recently heard Glenis Kinnock and Jay Nadeau hand over the baton to the younger generation. Well, I want to call on the younger generation to speak out and to act and to make this work and to really be active, participative citizens in our society. But I also want to call on us that are older, that have passion and power and experience to do the same. I think to talk about the future is only useful if for each and every individual one of us it leads to action now. Thank you. <laughs>